Tell me again. Um, I'm really excited because this is the fourth day of our summer school, summer camp, and this is the moment we are entering the treatment uh, arena. We have already seen how to practice on patients. We already had two afternoons full of patients and clinical activity, but this morning we are starting to fix the contents with slides and with the uh, uh, comments on uh, everything we have uh, seen so far. So, uh, uh, without any further delay, uh, let's start to present the index of contents of the uh, lecture we are about to listen this morning. We will start about the concept of the overload of the temporal mandibular joint, which is basically the uh, um, explaining hypothesis of what's happening to the majority of our patients. <coughs> it is only by understanding this very simple mechanism or concept of overload that the treatment in the form of management can be understood in terms of the rationale to provide it. And the treatment is provided in the form of management and I'm a firm believer that the multiple P approach, which is derived by the very famous triple P approach uh, suggested by one of my mentors, friend of the zoo in the field of practice management, uh, honestly applies even better and more concretely to the field of temporal mandibular disorders uh, patients. Because we get the plates, the oral appliances, we have the pep talk, which means counseling and uh, talking with the patients, uh, chatting with them, listening to them, and all the things we have seen so far. We got the pills, the drugs, the pharmaca, the, of, of course, different uh, nature and aim, ranging from the simple anti-inflammatory drugs for the acute management of pain or cause loss to the more complex situation of chronic pain. Even if you have to remember, again, the chronic pain cases have the most to do with some sort of uh, uh, central sensitization phenomena and are not strictly related to the concept of temporal mandibular disorders as we are trying to propose and to uh, summarize in this day. Then we got the psychological issues with all these uh, uh, concepts about the need to provide cognitive behavioral uh, uh, treatments and uh, uh, suggestions uh, to the patients to replace some bad habits, mandible bracing, uh, uh, fifth clenching, that may be at the basis of the overload. And then in the end we got the physiotherapy, move that mandible. We have already discussed the, the nature of the exercises we can propose to the patients. Uh, there's not an ideal protocol, but the basic concept is that the joints are made to be moved. And every time I listen uh, uh, a patient, uh, to a patient uh, um, telling me that the previous dentist has suggested to keep the mandible uh, firm, to don't move the mandible uh, just to not hear a joint sound, uh, I feel uh, negatively impressed by those suggestions because Mother Nature has made our joints to warm movement. And the body experience of every one of us is for sure plenty of examples that when you have, are forced to, to keep your joint uh, firm or not mobilized, in the end, you have muscle problems and you have uh, 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 difficulties to regain the typical and the normal, the physiological joint uh, uh, range of motion. So the temporal mandibular joint is not different. It is not because temporal mandibular joint issues belong to dentistry and because dentistry is a special field that we got a, a different joint with respect to the, to the other joints of the body. Okay? So keep this 
in mind every time you 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 have to suggest to do something to, to your patient. Then you have to, uh, some good physical therapy. So by doing it by yourself, you can teach uh, uh, patients some very simple exercises. We have already seen uh, uh, to increase and to enhance the, the power of all those psychological uh, approaches. So uh, doing good physiotherapy and the patient to move the mandible is part, in my mind, of the reassurance protocol. Is tactile psychology and physiotherapy are all connected. Then, of course, some friends of mine suggest that there is a sixth P, which is payment, which is actually really important, uh, especially in this era of financial crisis. But of course, if you uh, uh, provide uh, your treatment within this uh, kind of framework, even the, the sixth P is well deserved. Okay? Yeah, of course. Then we got some no P approaches. Think about uh, uh, working on dental occlusion. Think about TMJ surgery. So, as part of the treatment morning, we already have to discuss about that. And then there's a need to, to talk a little about what to do with chronic pain patients and why chronic pain patients they are a different matter with respect to the typical overloaded temporal mandibular disorder in the year. Then, to grasp the conclusions of the morning. So, starting with the first chapter of the morning, the overall theory. Uh, we have already, already, we have always been told by the precepts of the psychosocial model that we are dealing with a biopsychosocial model of pain, of disease, the 20th century is the uh, uh, century of the doctor-patient relationship uh, focused on the psychosocial uh, aspects and the relationship with biology, empathy with the patient, everything is good. But if we, uh, uh, the 21st century of course, sorry, but uh, if we think about the, the, the root of the term biopsychosocial, it means that we got a biological problem, which means an activation of pain pathways with or without a demonstrable pathological condition. That may have psychological antecedents as well as behavioral consequences existing within a social framework. A patient with an everyday life, expectations, activities, duties, and so on. So my question for you is, does it make sense at Chairside? When I got Mrs. Maria or Mrs. Mary uh, on Monday morning, can I tell her, Maria, you got some biological problem? There's a component related with your psyche, but you live in a society. And she correctly would uh, point the finger to me, uh, saying, uh, Doctor, and so? So we have to have clear in our mind that the biopsychosocial model of pain means nothing in terms of usefulness uh, uh, for the everyday message, everyday care of our patients. It is simply a framework that have, has correctly replaced all the other occlusive dogmas and the theories of the past. But it is not that we can treat a patient uh, uh, biopsychosocially or that a patient has pain because of a biopsychosocial problem. It means nothing. Or at least it is a difficult concept to transfer to the clinical practitioner because 
in my experience, I always hate to say in my experience because it, <laughs> it, 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 it's a combination of words that reminds me something about the gurus and the other. But in my honest experience, every one of us has experiences. Uh, uh, in my experience, patients uh, have difficulties to uh, accept, and also dentists, sorry, have difficulties. To to, to accept and to replace some old theory unless they are given a solid, concrete, alternative option. So, one of the problems I see and I saw since the, the beginning of these kind of courses with the Italian study group of uh, mandibular disorders uh, has always been the fact that uh, everyone seems to understand that occlusion is not the answer but we researchers have not been able to provide an alternative, fruitful uh, and uh, a feasible uh, option to really take care of the patient instead of looking at occlusion. I don't know if you agree or uh, uh, if you have understood the message. Basically, occlusion doesn't count. So, a dentist came to, to, to a lecture of yours and of course you have already all the papers, you have all the clinical experience suggesting that occlusion is not the answer. Okay? Uh, then, what to do? Oh, a list of questionnaires, uh, eat this food, fish boil at this temperature, uh, very generic statements that are not related with the expectation of the dentist who, willing it or not, have good experiences with oral appliances and uh, with sometimes uh, beliefs concerning dental occlusion. So you have to uh, uh, get out something of the mind and replace immediately with some uh, uh, concept that could be uh, really feasible for the everyday life. Otherwise, simply stating occlusion doesn't matter. We, we got a biopsychosocial problem is not the answer for the everyday life. And this is mostly true if you consider that the management options for the temporomandibular disorders are basically many and they are they're sh they share uh, uh, approximately let me say in 80% of the success. So uh, the treatment seems to be more or less unspecific. And yes, Tour provided a very nice uh, um, uh, quote or joke or example for the book I edited for Quintessence in 2010. It seems that we are doing the rain dance when it is about to rain. So. You can rain like that, you can do like that, or you can do like that, and it will rain. So, am I dancing better than you? Of course, I, I, I'm uh, uh, tempted to believe it because it is going to rain after my dance. And sometimes your dance uh, is not associated with rain because you choose the wrong patient, because there are chronic pain patients, but in general, all treatment modalities based on conservative approaches are uh, uh, giving very, very good results because of the natural progression of symptoms, because the fact that you give good information to the patient, because you cancel them, because of the, the epidemiology of disease. One of the concepts I have really uh, uh, care in my mind is the fact that uh, you have to know the epidemiology of a disorder. We are always focusing on the prevalence, how many people uh, have this kind of problem. Uh, we are always focusing on what to do to treat the purported di disorder, but very, very few information are available on the true epidemiology of a condition. 
what happens if if I don't treat the patient, if I treat the patient uh, uh, more conservatively with respect to more aggressive intervention and so on. The example is homeopathy. I will take this flower just uh, uh, born in my garden will prepare an homeopathic uh, uh, soup. I will take it for three days. I had a bad chill and it will disappear. Of course, how many days will are normally needed for a chill to disappear naturally? Three or two or two and a half. But that's an example of uh, inductive reasoning. I do something, I'm not interested in what should have happened if I didn't do that, and I immediately believe that my action is associated with the improvement. Temporomandibular disorders are the ideal ground for the guru theories because of their natural, natural fluctuation, because of the uh, uh, good answer to the majority of uh, conservative treatments in the majority of patients. So they are the perfect fit for this kind of inductive uh, uh, reason. So we are living and we are dealing with the field in which none of the remedies provides a substantially better outcome over the other therapies. Each treatment, believe it or not, is believed to have its own rationale. You perform an anterior position on appliance uh, because you think you have to uh, recapture the disc or to distract the condyle or to uh, uh, create more space within the joint capsule to, to uh, distribute the joint effusion. I perform a flat appliance. Uh, Ricardo, uh, 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 Leonardo used the T scan uh, uh, to, to, to create an appliance balancing every single content. And we all three have success in terms of pain reduction after one week, one month of uh, uh, appliance uh, from the appliance delivery. So, this is a very basic example of the fact that the appliance should have a common ground of action which is not related with the design. Otherwise, all the world, the research field, the clinical practitioners field, uh, should use the very same appliance. That's why it is so uh, let me say disturbing when I hear about the uh, Pinco Palo appliance. And I want to say live that when you will see or will listen to me uh, speaking about the Manfredini appliance, it's time to force me to retire. The concept should be clear in your mind. Because it is nice that due to this kind of inductive reasoning, we are always able to hypothesize and to provide the explanation of an hypothetical mechanism of action simply because we see that our uh, uh, work uh, provides some improvement. So, uh, uh, the treatment actually should be discriminated more in terms of safety, invasiveness, cost-benefit ratio than in terms of effectiveness or efficacy. By the way, uh, maybe the, the correct term for this slide should be effectiveness because it is the perceived subjective improved by the patient. So, just to, to conclude this introductory part, most treatments are not this specific. 
want to use an appliance for the left joint or an appliance for the right muscle, good luck to find a rational to do it. And this is due to the fact that we don't fully understand the pathophysiology of muscle pain, don't need to correct the anatomy of what's happening in the joint, and we don't have any specific modalities to reverse arthritis. So the, the main three categories of disorders or conditions for which the patient can uh, uh, ask for our advice <coughs> are not uh, uh, treatable or manageable with very specific uh, uh, tissue specific approaches with the exception of course of some uh, interventions like uh, arthrosynthesis or minor surgeries uh, for the arthritis. So uh, within this uh, framework Yesterday, we have seen a wonderful uh, excursus uh, on the DC TMD. Michalis uh, provided us with uh, uh, a fantastic uh, storyline uh, about the, the history taken, the, the, the examination of form, the diagnostic algorithm. It is the standard, and you have to do it. But my provocative question is does it really influence the treatment plan unless you have a patient with some extreme condition does it really have an impact on what you are deciding in terms of uh, designing a different appliance or using cognitive behavior treatment instead of uh, uh, physiotherapy or other kind of approaches. And how can fit this focus on the axis one with all the information coming uh, from the literature, from even us clinical researchers, on the need to uh, uh, work within a biopsychosocial framework? Yesterday, Mihalis uh, um, cited uh, the editorial of Sandro Palla. The title of that editorial in the Journal of Official Pain, dating back to some years ago, was Biopsychosocial Model Crippled, Azzoppato for the Italians. Why? Because it is evident, and in my mind, it is due. Uh, uh, to the invasion uh, of the research field by uh, groups that are not actually expert, that don't have the secondary knowledge to really appraise uh, the, the field, uh, it is clear that with respect to what was the intention in the 1992 research diagnostic criteria for temporomandibular disorders, uh, the use of the axis to to tailor us treatment protocols and even to assess the patients uh, has been really, really limited with respect to the AXIS-1 paper. And I can personally confirm it because uh, uh, we have performed, together with our group of uh, colleagues, the two main reviews concerning the history of the uh, RDC publications on AXIS-1. Yari was one of the co-authors in 2011, the journal Triple O, and we found many, many papers. With respect to what we have just found, we a review just published, just appeared in the journal of rehabilitation three or four days ago, uh, under my supervision, the author, the first author was uh, uh, a Brazilian postdoc uh, who was in Italy some years ago, Giancarlo de Vittore, together with Paolo Cesar Conti. And we found a very limited number of papers dealing with the axis too. So we got an instrument, 
that instrument is clinically important, but basically uh, the data coming out uh, from the literature uh, concerning the prevalence of all these uh, findings and the relationship with Axis 1 are really, really limited. And this is a, a very um, unfortunate way of action by the side of the researchers because, of course, uh, it didn't help increasing the knowledge and the possibility to transfer our uh, knowledge to the communities of clinicians. Because basically we had an instrument, but we don't have the data to rely on when we want to convey the message to the clinical practitioners. And for our experience, I'm going to time to decide the term experience, okay? But it is good in half an hour. And in our experience, uh, we have started to match patients in our clinical trials on arthrosynthesis, for example, also as for the axis too. Andre, that was maybe a missing point. You have to match patients also concerning the axis too. Because when you have, uh, it is difficult to have huge numbers of patients uh, uh, in randomized control trials. If you have, let me say, 20 or 15 patients per group, independent on the, the, the treatment modality uh, you, you are uh, uh, testing, it is enough that a couple or three psychosocially compromised patients went by chance in one group and, and you have some uh, uh, lower psycho average in the other group and you got three failures in, out of 15 patients in one group and zero failures uh, in the other group just because of the random distribution and casualty of number, of course. Uh, with 100 participants, that shouldn't be a problem. But we now know that the axis 2 is a treatment predictor. So we have to consider it for all our uh, treatment studies. So the, the inevitable uh, uh, subsequent question is, if a detailed axis one uh, assessment is really related with the prognosis of the patient, or does the prognosis belong to the axis two? I guess you know the answer. And we have seen clinical evidence in our office. How many patients? Uh, uh, we have seen over these uh, first two days, eight, nine, I don't remember. I guess even if you were, let me say, beginners, maybe Anna, I can use uh, uh, you to give this example. I guess that even this very uh, limited number of patients, thanks to the opportunity that you have seen them with our eyes, have been enough to understand that the access to issues are really important. Have you ever felt during these days the need to look at patient's occlusion? Really? Gualtiero? Have you ever felt the need to look at dental occlusion during these two days? It is not so important. It is not so important. And it is only uh, uh, the way you look at patients that makes dental occlusion so important. When I listen to concepts now they have been uh, 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 let me say they have gained new life all those concepts of confluent diagnosis of occlusal diagnosis of course we are all able to 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 state generic statements that diagnosis is fundamental of course <laughs> that's medicine but 
the diagnosis in the TMD field is not based on looking at occlusion. So you are diagnosing something else. And you are preparing a treatment plan based on something else. That, just because of the fluctuation of the symptoms, the charisma of the operator, the fact that you are willing to not creating empathy uh, uh, within the people, may have a good success inductive reason. So access to is the key. We have already seen this kind of example yesterday, so no need to, to get deeper. But if you simply look at the history, apart from the curious fact that uh, she, she has done orthodontics uh, during the detection, and that's absurd, but that's real life. Sometimes you see patients like that uh, uh, stating, oh, doctor, I have done orthodontics. Orthodontics. Uh, based on the history of the patient, the, the uh, access to evaluation and what you did, your appliance and your cognitive behavioral treatment have been fundamental to, to solve the symptoms. But then you look at the patient's social life and there was a fluctuation of symptoms based on the life events until one day my nurse came to me saying, oh, our place was really good, but uh, the, the lady has a new boyfriend. That's life. That's life. So what's up? I don't know. <laughs> of course, of course, thanks to, to, to Nikki, this patient, when uh, uh, became a faithful follower of your uh, office, of your team, can be transformed into a normal dental or orthodontic, in this case, patient. So you can try to challenge the, the possibility to, or the mandatory uh, surgical intervention, and you can try to, to, to close the gap. You perform orthodontic treatment. She's still doing it. But we didn't do orthodontics to uh, uh, solve the TND. So every time we see it tomorrow with Marcia, every time we, we uh, think about the relationship between ortho or prosto and temporomandibular disorders, and uh, you are asked what to do in the case of individuals uh, uh, with a history of TMD who need prostodontic treatment. That's another issue that makes me crazy because the prostodontic uh, uh, need is a very vague concept, especially if we now know that it's not based on medical reasons. So let, let me be generous <coughs> and consider the uh, fact that uh, you got many patients with pain that are also asking to replace their teeth, to perform orthodontics and to do everything. It is simple. You have to solve the pain as we did. Maybe even find a new boyfriend or, or girlfriend to, to the patient. You, you can... Uh, Nice, some sort of uh, 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 quarry solitary single uh, single earth uh, agency. Okay, but once you have solved that uh, uh, problem, which is the reason why patients uh, uh, come to your office, they became normal dental. So there are no secrets, there are no positions, there are no instruments. Okay? So, the real challenge is how to apply this biopsychosocial model at Chelsea. Spicing 
social and uh, psych and biology is not enough for Mrs. Nair. And the answer is really simple. Think about muscle overload. The model, even I'm conscious with the risk of oversimplifying it, the model is really linear and intuitive. And we have an entire life. I will work hopefully for the next 30 or 40 years. And I will be there to, to, to fight against uh, everyone. To defend our beliefs and to defend our patients. Because the model I see in my clinical practice of over 7,000 temporal liver disorder patients is reconductible to something like that. We got the emotions, we got the life, we got the personality, and we bite our lives. So that kind of clenching or mandible bracing in the end leads to the overload of the system and the trigger, the presence, the manifestation, the onset of symptoms. Where are they related to the joint, or to the muscle, or to the right, or to the left, or both, or combination? Is simply, simply in brackets, due to the host response. And the challenge is not to challenge this model, because the model is there to see. The challenge is to define the, the details of this host response. A symmetry of facial skeleton, condylar size and shape, amount of uh, muscular uh, activity, hormonal issues in the women, uh, uh, pain uh, thresholds, genetics. But the linearity of the model is there to see. So, if you see, if you look at temporal mandibular disorder patients with a different eye with respect to the average practitioners, you will easily see that they have dental occlusions similar to the ones of patients who are performing dental hygiene in the, in the next room to yours. But they all or almost all have this kind of clinical science. This kind of clinical science, which are not common in, let me say, normal dental patients. And this is uh, so logical that as you have seen and we have seen during these days, it can easily explain the evolution of closer lock. Closer lock. The dis displacement without reduction with limited opening. The DC TMD. I got the closed mouth and I got the open mouth position, just a small range, reduced range of movement, maybe 15 millimeters or so maybe 20, disc is displaced, disc is displaced. What should this kind of patient do if he or she lives uh, in the mountains over the uh, white marble quarries uh, in a rainy day during the Friday evening, no doctors there? What can she or he do? <laughs> real life, real life, real life. No, the patient doesn't know anything. First thing to do, the general practitioner. Hey, doctor, I cannot open my, my mouth. But outside is raining. Uh, it is not possible to go to the hospital. The hospital is 80 kilometers away. Take anti-inflammatory drugs and muscular relaxant. Monday will come. And what happened on average on Monday? After 48 or 72 hours, 
maybe salt. More or less, the the lock will be salt, yeah. or partially salt. And so, my question for you: Does an anti-inflammatory uh, 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 <laughs> needle in your bottom <laughs> help you recapturing the disc? I don't think so. It should be good. You can add it on the labels. <laughs> Fans are good to recapture the disc. Wonderful. Anyone seems to be shocked by the simplicity of the, this message and by the fact that it is completely ignored when uh, we are forced to, to, to categorize things, to categorize disease, to, to consider treatment protocols, the recapturing manure. I saw many patients during the first years of my career uh, uh, coming from the emergency, being unlocked by my professor, and going back to the emergency the day after. <laughs> so, anti inflammatory drugs and move the mandible. And it is not rare, we have seen it yesterday with the, uh, the, the young patient, that in the end, the, the disc may be even recaptured. So the lock is a muscular contraction for antalgic purposes, and it is always the result of prolonged bracing and clenching activity. In Italy, we see that cuor contento those people living naive, without problems, are really involved in this kind of problems. These kind of problems, we close a lot, especially during the adolescence, always regard those individuals, mostly famous because of the uh, uh, lower muscle force and, and tolerability of the joint, with high family or social or school related demand. I, I remember of a um, 18 or 19 year old patient a couple of weeks ago. She has been able to enter the competition for the dental school in Italy after studying classical uh, studies at the high school. For the Italians, you know you, uh, what it means. She studied Greek, Latin, and all this stuff for five years. Stopped in July, and in September, she had to enter uh, the, the faculty of dentistry with competition questions based on mathematics, physics, biology, and she entered. The result, she was locked. And I told her, it's normal. How many hours did you pass on the books? with so many expectations from your family, the father, the mother. And of course, that's not a problem. That's part of the daily stress that any one of, of us should be able to, to, to carry and to bear. So the fundamental concept of TMD treatment is to manage clenching or bracing and its consequences. And if you think about this overload concept, immediately, suddenly, all the clinical information, or the clinical evidences we have, immediately fit with the research uh, uh, observation. And remember that when you got a theory or a hypothesis in your mind, there's a very simple rule I, I, I love to, 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 to share. The theory has more probability to be valid or good, the less the exception to the theory you, you, you are forced to give to, to explain the observation. And with dental theories, based on dental occlusion for TMD patients, 
we are continuously forced to, to, to have exceptions to our theories. I design an appliance to reposition the mandible, the patient is not able to wear it, I uh, modify it into something different, but I have an explanation for the fact, but that's an exception. My patient has a, a deep bite and has temporomandibular joint uh, pain. I see nine patients with deep bite without, but because that's the clinical evidence, one against nine, uh, 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 without, without uh, TMJ symptoms. So that's an exception. But I got an explanation because of in that particular same patient, the deep bite is responsible to create an anterior wall and the other nine with the arterial wall are loose, are lost. So with the overload theory you can explain first why why patients with warm teeth don't have generally muscle pain because warm teeth is the result of grinding and grinding is an isotonic uh, exercise the problem for the muscles and the joint is the isometric exercise I will not destroy my muscles if I do like that four times per hour but I will experience many problems if I, if I stay eight hours like that for all the nights of my life. Or to, 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 to do the same example with the biceps, to, 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 to stay something like that with the weight. Even uh, uh, not so heavy. Second, the overall theory explains the paradox effectiveness of oral appliances. Because they seem to work because they uh, uh, modify something in the, the dental field. But actually, the, the, the effects of the oral appliances is not related to the occlusal changes because there is an absence of superiority of one appliance design over the <coughs> other. Again, like in the field of prosto and ortho. This doesn't mean that you can design whatever you want. Okay? It simply means that any reasonable appliance that can be tolerated by the patient independently by the user design has good uh, uh, chance to solve symptoms. The overall theory, as in the patient we have seen yesterday, explains why sometimes we got we perceive the need to, to change something. And that's why patients, as soon as the symptoms are improved, should start wearing the appliance for with an intermittent use. Less time. Because the appliance doesn't make the patient stop clenching. And in the end, even if you have changed something in the way the muscle works, uh, uh, work, and in the, in the low, the TMJ area, the patient is keeping on uh, uh, doing, producing forces with those muscles, recruiting the new muscle fibers, and loading the new joint area for a prolonged period of time. And that explains the relapse of symptoms in patients wearing the appliance 24-7 uh, uh, per prolonged period. And it, it can easily seen, be seen in the stories told us by patients uh, uh, who experienced it. an improvement in the first month of treatment by wearing the appliance 20, 24 hour a day, but then immediately after three, four weeks, they started having uh, uh, a bouncing back of the, the symptoms. And think about
about this very simple issue in terms of occlusive finalization. You know the standard protocol for occlusal finalization in temporal mandibular disorder? Appliance to find the position. Ortho and appliance in the end. In my mind, there are at least two passages that are ethically not justifiable. Because if you are so uh, uh, firmly believing in the efforts of occlusal finalization, you, you should uh, avoid to, to put the appliance in the end. Just for maintenance, see what happens. Remember, it's doping versus anti-doping. This overload theory explains the role of the psyche. I was told that the psyche is the fifth determinant of the stomatognatic system. We got the two PMJs, we got the muscles, and we got the teeth. Fantastic. It, it, it's like to say the biopsychosocial. Mrs. Mary, you got an important fifth determinant. <laughs> that can be, uh, there was a play with the P, but I don't remember, but perpetuating, uh, uh, predisposing, some factor, triggering, but uh, in Italian uh, there's a P, a factor. Actually, with this kind of overload uh, mechanism, the, the psyche is important since the beginning because it is the psychic background of the patient that makes it so uh, uh, explainable of this, all these, let me say, chain of events. The overall theory explains why almost all the teenagers we, we see with this displacement and with pain at the age of 18 have a small mandible because they have small condyles in shape which are less able to tolerate load. And the overall theory explains the fast needle into the bottom. Okay? I think that we can conclude this part and greet our Facebook friends. And thank you, Anna, of course, for being such a lovely camera woman. <laughs>